Welcome back to Face the Nation. We're now joined by former acting director of the CIA and CBS News senior national security contributor Michael Morrell, as well as career diplomat, former ambassador William Burns, who also recently authored a book called The Back Channel. Thanks so much to both of you for being here. Welcome. Great to be with you. Um, I want to start on the immediate crisis around Syria. Uh, Mike, you know the general who clearly uh, knows what's happening on the ground. He was pretty polite in what he said, but his frustration in terms of the promises made to the Kurds was clear. Right. How much of an, a loss to U.S. intelligence is it to have this pullout from northern Syria? So the Kurds were doing a number of things for us. They were actually fighting ISIS for us um, in a very significant way, and that is now lost. They were also collecting intelligence for us and giving that to us so that we could use it in our fight against ISIS and on the other side of the border um, in what the Iraqis were doing. And I don't know that we've lost that, but I bet you either have or it is at significant risk. And who benefits from that besides ISIS? ISIS benefits, the Russians benefit because they're going to be the ones getting that intelligence now or the Syrian, the Syrian regime is going to benefit. Um, but the, the, biggest, the biggest winner here is ISIS. Uh, Bill, I mean, you've You've negotiated with Erdogan, with a number of these regional players. Um, you know, typically it, it, it's a rule that military presence gives diplomatic leverage when you're in a negotiation. When Vice President Pence went to Turkey this week, he promised to lift U.S. sanctions. He seemed to promise that the U.S. allies would withdraw from this area as well. Was this a negotiation or was this, as some say, a surrender? Yeah, I mean, I think there was a smart way and a dumb way to deal with what was a very complicated situation in which we had modest leverage in northeast Syria. I think we chose the dumb way. In one impulsive presidential phone call, we, in a sense, gave away our leverage. And then in a pretty hasty negotiated ceasefire, we threw the Kurds under the bus. Um, and essentially gave Erdogan everything he wanted. And so while well, the president has called this a great deal, if this is a great deal, I'd hate to see what a bad one is because the winners, as Mike suggested, are not only the Turks and the Russians, uh, but also the Assad regime and the Iranians, and I'm afraid ultimately ISIS, which is going to try to revive itself um, out of the chaos and the insecurity and the grievance on which it thrives. Is this hyperbolic in some ways, I mean, that American influence has diminished because of this one single decision? I don't think so at all. So you have all of what Bill said in terms of what happens in the Middle East, but there's also the broader message that this sends to the entire world, right? And there's two things. One is that might makes right, right? That you can accomplish with violence um, differences between countries. And that's not something that is in American interest, right, to have that view in the world. The other is that the American word, right, the American guarantees that we provide to people aren't worth anything, right? That at the end of the day is going to strengthen people like China and people like Russia who are going to come in behind us and make promises that they can't keep. It was, that's what was interesting to hear General Thomas say. There was an understanding that America had given its word there. Bill, I want to uh, switch to another topic because you know personally many of the diplomats who have gone up to Capitol Hill and behind closed doors given testimony about what has happened with Ukraine. Um, you were scathing in an op-ed that you wrote uh, in terms of Secretary Pompeo, who you said was derelict in his duty, not protecting his diplomats. He took a shot at you this morning um, and said you're just auditioning for a role in the next administration as Elizabeth Warren's Secretary of State. Is that what you're doing? Uh, no. Um, you know, my, my concerns, the concerns I expressed in that article are not about politics. You know, like Michael, I spent three and a half decades proudly serving presidents of both parties. Um, it, my concerns are about the hollowing out of American diplomacy. Whether you measure that in tangible ways, the sidelining of career expertise, not standing up for your people when they're unfairly accused, um, but also intangible ways. You know, when President Trump was asked a little more than a year ago whether he was concerned about a record number of senior vacancies in the State Department, he said, no, not really, because I'm the only one who matters. That's diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism, not the diplomacy I learned as a young diplomat many years ago working for presidents like George H.W. Bush and secretaries of state like Jim Baker. But for people on the outside, when they hear the president say, well, this is just deep state bureaucrats being frustrated, they're being sidelined. What is important about having done this professionally? 
I mean, what, what is it that is lost when you have one of the president's friends intervene, as you had Rudy Giuliani and Gordon Sondland, who is a political appointee, a financial donor? Many presidents appoint financial donors to ambassadorships. That's true. But I think what we're seeing right now is career public servants like Ambassador Yovanovitch who are fulfilling their obligation to tell the truth when they're asked by Congress, um, and they're doing it honorably, and they're doing it with their heads held high. That's a pretty sharp contrast to the behavior of the president and people around him who are doing a pretty good job of concealing their own sense of decency right now. And just to, just to add, Margaret, um, expertise, knowledge, experience are extraordinarily important to making the right decisions in government, and that's what's being lost by not relying on these people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the intelligence community has been accused by this president of having its own deep state of just he was disrupting and they didn't like it and they pushed back is the president's narrative around this. Um, the attorney general ha who launched this investigation into the origins of the Russia probe, which concluded definitively that it was Russia that meddled in the 2016 election, um, seems to be expanding this probe. Right. What is the impact of this? on the intelligence community? So I think that that uh, Durham's investigation at Barr's behest into the intelligence community's work on the link between the Trump campaign and um, the Russians is OK in one respect and not OK in the other. The respect that it's OK is taking a look at what the intelligence community did and answering the question, was it done by the book from a legal perspective? Was it consistent with statute? That's OK to me. What's not OK is to put the analysts under a spotlight and say, did they get the analysis right? Why is that not OK for me? It's, a, it's not OK for two reasons. One is that the Justice Department has no experience, um, no knowledge of, um, no particular um, perspective to bring to bear on analysis. And they're likely to get the answer wrong because their standards of making a judgment are very, very, very different from the intelligence community standards. And I think there is going to be an effect on analysts who now have to go out and hire lawyers before they sit down with a Department of Justice prosecutor. There's going to be an effect on analysts in terms of them saying, do I really want to make the hard call in the future? Do you, John Brennan, former head of the CIA, and Jim Clapper, former director of national intelligence, uh, have, CBS has confirmed that they've been approached for, yes. to yes. answer these questions. Are yes. you saying this is all political and not legitimate? So, so there are questions, right? There are questions out there about whether the intelligence community and the FBI did the right thing, right? From a legal perspective, I think it's okay to look at that and put that issue to rest. Mm -hmm. I don't like looking at analysis because that's a completely different issue. Yeah. Last word here, um, Ambassador, Mike brought up all these people having to go out and hire lawyers and sort of defend their positions. Do you see this as a long-term hit to the national security architecture of this country? It is. I mean, I think it's, it's really taking a toll on career public servants and an expertise, as Michael said, at precisely the moment when the United States needs to rely on that expertise, whether it's in the intelligence community, the State Department, the Defense Department, more than any other time, because we're on a very competitive international landscape and we're digging a very deep hole for ourselves right now. Thanks very much to both of you for lending mm -hmm. us your expertise. We'll be right back with our political panel. We turn now to our political panel for some analysis, and we know you need it. It's been a busy week. Susan Davis is a congressional correspondent for NPR. Jamal Simmons is the host of The Remedy on Hill TV, a Democratic strategist, and now, congratulations, a new CBS News political contributor. Thank you. Good Welcome to, you. to the family. Michael Steele is a Republican strategist, and Paula Reed is a White House correspondent here at CBS, and she also keeps a very close eye on the Justice Department for us <laughs> as well. So, Paula, you're a lawyer. Recovering. Okay. <laughs> Recovering. <laughs> Tell me, what happened this week when Mick Mulvaney went to that podium and said what he said? This morning, he's out there trying to walk it back yet again. That's Legally right. What changed? Well, Democrats have taken some, some criticism for holding most of their hearings behind closed doors, hearing from witnesses, not, not in the public sphere. But then they got the best witness imaginable, not just in the public sphere, but on national television at the White House podium. 
Mulvaney came out, not only did he confirm the quid pro quo, which he, he has subsequently walked back, but that's, that's, a significant, that's a significant blow to the impeachment defense, but he also kind of muddied the waters even further on the Durham review, which is already under some scrutiny, as Morrell just mentioned, as to whether this is actually a review where they're trying to gather facts or whether they're trying to give the president a political win. So Democrats could not have asked for a better witness than Mick Mulvaney at the podium. And this morning, he tried to just deny that he said there was a quid pro quo. I went back, I looked at the transcript. He was asked repeatedly, are you saying this aid was tied to cooperation in this investigation? And he said yes. And the DOJ did not like what they heard. They issued a statement. Not at all. They did issue a statement. I got some other comments to words I can't say on TV, but they were <laughs> livid because they know that the Durham review is all, there's already some skepticism about that. If this is Barr trying to do what the president has long asked the Justice Department to do. And so to have Mulvaney muddy the waters, they were not happy. So you had Adam Schiff, who's leading mm -hmm. this investigation as chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, said Mulvaney took it from very bad to worse. This was a gift to him, but does it actually move the needle politically in any way? Yes, because I think, to Paula's point, this happened on public television, which is the problem that Democrats have had is making this case to the public. A lot of what we know, and we should, most of what we know has been leaked either by Democrats on the committee or through the testimony from the people that have come that have given it to us. They've been, there's been some 55 hours of testimony just last week, and we don't know a lot of that. So when these public moments happen, certainly Mulvaney helped Democrats' case. I mean, it was also what it had the effect of doing was blowing up three weeks of semi-coordinated Republican messaging on Capitol Hill trying to defend the president's actions and Mulvaney saying that erased all of it and left all of the president's allies on the hill once again scrambling to try and defend this behavior. That's not the first time that has happened though Michael for, no. for Republicans to have to adapt to the changing talking point. Uh, does it matter in terms of changing the calculus of standing by the president? Of course, it makes it much more difficult to stand by the president when he admits that there is a quid pro quo, when his administration admits that there is a quid pro quo. I do think, to Sue's point, this highlights the weakness of House Democrats' efforts right now because they're doing it behind closed, behind closed doors, because they're not making a public case. Impeachment is an inherently political exercise, and they are not telling the public why it needs to happen. But which Republicans are actually going to back away? That's a very, very difficult question. I think right now a lot of the smartest Republicans, at least in the Senate, are sticking with what he did was wrong, but it does not rise to the level of impeachment a year before the election. And that's a position they can, they can defend, at least until the next shoe drops. <laughs> the caveat there being, being key. Um, Jamal, I mean, for, for us on the campaign trail, we also had the other Democratic attempt to not impeach the president, to remove him from office through the election path. Anything that actually moved the needle on that debate stage that we all watched? Well, the debates, uh, the debates did move the needle for a couple of candidates. Um, I think uh, Pete Buttigieg did something very well at the debate stage. He, um, he kind of stood up for American honor and integrity. You didn't really hear a lot of people kind of make that argument. Um, and, but the national security defense on that stage, I thought it was very strong. Uh, Amy Klobuchar obviously has had a moment What's tough for her is she doesn't have any money. There's a saying, you know, in order to catch lightning, you've got to have a bottle. Um, she doesn't really have very much of one, and so she's going to have some trouble building up. I want to give it to one more thing that uh, Michael just said. The difference between what the Republicans trying to say that if Trump, uh, Trump did something wrong, we're not impeachable. Democrats did this when Bill Clinton was in office. The difference here is Bill Clinton went on television in August of 1998 and said, what I did was wrong. He actually took accountability after getting cornered. He took accountability for what he did was wrong, which then gave every Democrat the ability to go out in public and say that without getting in trouble with the White House. Mm -hmm. That's not the rule right here with the Republicans uh, in the Senate, in the House, with the President. And I think if I were the White House, they don't pay me for advice, they need a, they need a war room <laughs> fast where they can coordinate their messaging. They need a Mark Fabiani or Crystal Hayne or somebody who can stand at the podium and say, or stand in some part of the complex mm -hmm. and give people the facts from the White House perspective. Otherwise, somebody else is gonna catch a case. We have to take a quick break, regroup, come back with more from our panel. So stay with us. We're back now with our political panel. Um, it was a busy news week. It was also a sad one, yeah. particularly here on Capitol Hill with the passing of Elijah Cummings, really uh, a giant in Washington. On a human level, I think Cummings was what fewer and fewer members of Congress are, as he had 
commanded profound respect across the political spectrum. And you had, obviously, Democrats, in the words of Nancy Pelosi, she said they lost a North Star for the party. But you also saw effusive praise from Republicans who he did hardcore hand-to-hand -hand combat with over the years, who also praised him as sort of one of the honest players in the game. On a practical political level, Democrats have also lost one of their best chairmen, mm -hmm. also one of their chairmen who was leading the impeachment investigation, and not beyond the impeachment investigation, oversight, the committee he was running, was looking at everything from the treatment of children at the border to the cost of prescription drugs, core Democratic Party issues in which he was a player, and figuring out who's going to fill that role is going to be incredibly hard for Democrats. One other thing I would say is the Speaker announced he will lie in state in the Capitol this week. That does not happen very often. The last member of Congress who did it was John McCain, obviously a very storied career. So it is a testament to his life and legacy that he's going to be given that honor. And Jamal, you yeah. and your family knew him. Yeah, he was my wife's first boss out of college. So uh, he was a very close member of her network and mentor. Um, and uh, I interviewed Cedric Richmond this week uh, for our show on the Hill. And he, uh, he said very specifically that there were tears in the caucus. People were fighting back tears in the Democratic caucus when they had the meeting um, after he passed away. And I think there's a real loss, um, not only there, but he sat as a bridge between sort of the, the squad that everybody talks about, because he had three members of the squad that sat on that government oversight committee, um, and he kind of tried to mentor them. So he was one of the voices from kind of the old guard that some of this new guard was going to listen to. So the Democrats, are, they've lost a, a big voice, a big uh, voice personally, and there's a void there also in how they govern the caucus. And, and he was a, a friend to this show, um, and I know we remembered him this week. Um, but when it came to the job he was doing in this moment, uh, I think you, Jamal, said he was signing subpoenas was, on the I day he, he died. Was, uh, the night before, he asked the staff to come up, and he was signing documents. Well, we know uh, one of the stories that Mick Mulvaney also brought to the public eye this week, um, <laughs> Paulette Michael, was this decision to bring the G7 world leaders to the president's own golf course, Doral, next year. Yeah. Last night, that was reversed. It didn't take House oversight to stop <laughs> it from happening, though. Why they did tried. Uh, they They <laughs> definitely yeah. would have tried. Um, why the reversal? This is the first big high profile reversal I've seen from President Trump of something that he was personally committed to, personally in, um, behind. And I think it was because he was getting bipartisan pushback on this because it was simply obviously indefensible. And I think that his chief of staff's explanation this morning that the president still sees himself as being in the hospitality industry is profoundly disturbing for a number of Americans who'd like him to have higher priorities. This morning, the White House is deferring to the president's tweet, which effectively says, well, Democrats and the media were upset, so I'm going to backtrack. Since when is that his philosophy? And we know this has to be a political calculation, because the president floated this idea at the G7 this year, in August. And at that time, senior White House officials told me, of course, he wouldn't even mention that it's, unless it had been vetted. And they said it had been vetted, the emoluments clause concerns, conflict of interest. So they understood the legal and ethical concerns. They put it out there this week anyway. And then at some point, they must have decided that without Republican support, the optics of backtracking were preferable to the fight. Michael, the president often says he doesn't back down. Does the fact that he did on this signal that he's getting worried that Republicans aren't there? I think him? this is one more front he needed to fight. He couldn't fight on when he was already fighting on Syria, on Ukraine. He needs to keep the support of those Republicans, particularly in the Senate, in order to avoid being removed from office. And I think this is one more fight he didn't want to have. It just seems like that hotel, uh, you know, they searched the entire country, and this was the only place I could find. It was very Dick Cheney of them, right? <laughs> you know, he was the only he vice president. He was the only vice president that George Bush could find after he ran the VP search. Um, you know, the hotels just seem to function more and more as sort of the presidential tip jar. Um, they're the place where you go, you stay in Washington, you stay there, the president knows that you stay there before you go have your meeting in, 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 uh, at the White House. And also, if you are now a foreign leader, you know, you come and you stay at a presidential hotel. If you're in the Air Force and you stop in Europe, you go and stay at a presidential hotel. It just seems to be the place where the money gets a little put in the president's, you know, jar, and then you can go and do business. The, the president claims it was not going to be for profit. Uh, that is what Mick said from the podium. Exactly, but they had no no explanation on how exactly they would determine uh, what the costs were that should be either donated or just not passed along to the president. And the idea that the president's brand doesn't need any help, well, we all know empirically that's not true. And he has taken a hit uh, on his, his personal business since he's come to the White House. Jamal, I want to ask you about this extraordinary charge by 
former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, that one of the 2020 candidates who was later confirmed she met Tulsi Gabbard was somehow working for Russia. Why did she say that? You know, it's, it is often hard to know exactly uh, what the Clintons are up to and, and how they're thinking about things. What may be true, though, is that she is worried about something happening to the Democratic nominee that she feels happened to her in 2016. And she is willing to sacrifice herself to raise these questions very early to try to preempt whatever that, those attacks may be. Um, now, Tulsi Gabbard has a big following on the internet, so a big following among some of the more progressive voices in the party. So they did not take this laying down. They came for Hillary Clinton pretty hard. But now we're talking about an unfaced the nation. Well, it, <laughs> they both came out swinging and pretty hard. Yeah, Tulsi shot back pretty hard. She did. I mean, she's obviously someone who has been struggling in the Democratic presidential primary. It was kind of a bizarre t attack. I mean, it was a bizarre news week to begin with. And then you add this Hillary Clinton attack out of nowhere on a member of her own party. I mean, there is a certain underlying truth that if you listen to all the intelligence officials and members of Congress and some people in the administration, there are still ongoing efforts to meddle in the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. It's a real present threat to the country. I think Hillary Clinton could be a voice on that, but the way that she stepped out to use it yeah. was just a really bizarre first step. It was good to have all of you here today. Thanks for your analysis. We'll be right back. There are a few things left that aren't political in this town. The Nationals heading to the World Series is one of them. But more vital are the public servants who work no matter if it is a Republican or a Democrat in office. They have uncomfortably stepped into the spotlight with this crisis and they are warning that their particular nonpartisan brand of patriotism is endangered. This week and last, diplomats were stuck between the choice of defying a White House order not to answer questions or ignoring the congressional subpoena that compelled them. Each spoke out, led first by Marie Yovanovitch, a respected ambassador who said she had nothing to do with Ukraine's scandal and may have had her career cut short because of that. One of the men working on that project, Ambassador Gordon Sundland, said he felt bad about it. And even he, one of the president's friends, now thinks the professionals should have been left in charge. A senior aide to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Mike McKinley, said he quit in part because no one was defending public servants like Marie against political targeting. With more testimonies this week, it may be worth listening to those quiet voices who have issued a warning that mixing politics and foreign policy comes at a cost and that personal benefit should not be confused with public good. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. And thank you to the Jones Day Law Firm for the facilities here on Capitol Hill. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.